So everything's looking good? Looks fantastic. All right, everybody. Hey, I'm so glad to be back. Um, and when this COVID blues blows over, we'll all get back together and we'll have an in-person conference. But this is pretty good and it's a snowy day. It's a good time to be inside. So, so as Brooke said, I'm gonna talk about uh, an interesting topic that farmers ask about, and it's gonna be on exploring the integration of minerals, biology, and energy for plant health and pest resistance. I am at the University of Kentucky, but I am speaking from 35 years as a consultant and uh, ag specialist working in alternative farming systems. So just as a note there. And so I got, there's a, there's a small delay with the advance. Okay, there it is. So let's just look back. Uh, you know, starting in the 1960s, we became aware of problems with commercial uh, pesticides. And in more recent time frame, over the last 20 years or so, people have seen an incredible uh, population crash with insects, bees, birds. All these guys have performed critical functions in natural ecosystems. I mean, if we don't have bees, we're not going to have lots of different fruits and vegetables. So suspected causes include loss of habitat, agricultural pesticides, and electromagnetic frequency interference. And so let's see, let me try that again. So that brings us to what farmers have done in response to uh, commercial agriculture since the turn of the century when uh, fertilizers were introduced, we had fewer and fewer animals on the farm, fewer rotations, and this loss of organic matter and soil biology over time. Uh, there's been a number of these alternative farming systems that have come up over the decades. And all of these are really focused on trying to create local healthy food systems. There's a real interest in non-toxic pest control. There's an intent to design agroecosystems that mimic nature and take advantage of things like biodiversity, less soil disturbance, using mulches, and all of that, all these systems with, that focus on organic matter and soil and uh, build soil carbon, and it really promotes the healthy consortia of beneficial microorganisms. So that includes like sustainable agriculture, which has been really big with USDA, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program in our NRCS, really uh, big emphasis on cover crops. Organic includes both the certified organic with USDA National Organic Program, but also organic agriculture in general. Permaculture, which is an ecological design system. It's not really a farming system per se, but it's a set of ethics and principles to design ecological landscapes and, and built habitats. And then there's been natural farming systems that have come out of Japan, Korea, India. All three of these have really interesting on-farm preparations that serve for both fertility and pest control. Uh, and then holistic grazing, mob grazing, rotational grazing, all of that integrated with crops and cover crops really has been the basis of sustainable agriculture for millennia. If any civilization has tried to go out and do agriculture and ignore that, they have come crashing down. And then there's biodynamic agriculture from Europe, started with Rudolf Steiner, been in uh, Aaron Fried Pfeiffer brought to the United States. And then what um, Brooke and Jenny asked me to talk about was advanced organic farming. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today is eco-agriculture which has been big influence from USA, Acres USA magazine. So when you think about these um, different alternative farming systems, let's look at, for example, the diffusion innovation curve or the bell-shaped curve. And this is, this is um, a model that actually came out of people that studied cooperative extension service and how um, the universities would go out to farms and talk about new practices, and they came up with this model on a bell-shaped curve where you have, you have innovators, you have early adopters, you have the early majority, late majority, and then laggards. And so I would say definitely these alternative farming systems on, are innovators and early adopters. Uh, you'll also have innovative farmers in there. In every state, you'll have innovative farmers. 
you'll have um, majority of farmers falling in the big portion of the bell-shaped curve. I would say that land-grant universities are in the big bell-shaped curve. Sometimes they're the innovators and they're trying to lead people, but you don't really want, <laughs> I mean, farmers, they don't, wanna, they don't wanna do things that are sketchy. They wanna know things that are proven. That's why the universities are solid right there in the middle. And then you have laggards and that's really risk averse farmers and bankers. And, you know, you don't fall into one category and stay there. You, you know, you just kind of shift back and forth, but that's just an interesting model. Uh, then I want to mention the Acres USA magazine and trade show influence. And what's interesting about that is that it actually started 50 years ago this summer of June. So um, 1971, 2021. The conference and trade show has gone on for 46 years. It was started by Charles Walters, who was an ag journalist. He really emphasized economic and ecological approach. But what's important to note is that it has been really influential on, for example, the eco farm and Asilomar that Bob Contisano, Bob Amigo Contisano started, but also the Bionutrient Food Association that Dan Kittredge started, who's a speaker and advancing eco-agriculture, which is what John Kemp started, and he is also a speaker. So um, the other part of this, and this is what a farmer actually asked me to include this in my talks one time, is that the, there's an old saying that, you know, we make progress by standing on the shoulders of giants. And so Acres USA has both these pioneers, people like Weston A. Price, William Albrecht, Terry Reams, Phil Callahan, Elaine Ingham, and then a whole bunch of different teachers, authors, and consultants. Uh, let's see, you've got uh, Gary Zimmer's real well-known, Neil Kinsey, Arden Anderson, Bruce Tinio, Dan Scow, and um, let's see, just a whole bunch of people all through there. And so one thing I should note about that is one of the interesting features of the eco-ag model has been really post-college education for farmers. And it's a real common practice to set up a three or four day seminar to spend time with one of these teachers and study just one thing, just one thing like compost teas for four days or how to read a soil test for four days or how to make good compost for four days. So that's the real quick introduction. And that brings me to this slide. And are you still seeing, let's see if we can hide the floating there. Yes, there we go. So, so this one came out of my, my teaching approach is having gone to a number of Acres USA conferences and tried to dissect what's going on because it's such a smorgasbord of ideas is that what I really think the, the theme here are the three pillars of eco-agriculture, minerals, biology, and energy. So first we're gonna talk about minerals and that is a broad topic. It includes soil testing and then how to take the soil test, interpret it, and come back with either rock minerals or rock dust, sea minerals, mineral balancing, fuller fertilization, and fertigation. So let's start into that one. And let's start with these tenets of eco-agriculture. And these tenets are just like the way people think it is. It's not set in stone. It's not proven completely. It's not an axiom of science. It's just the way that you know, it has been approached. And so one big emphasis is on mineral depletion in, in foods, in the soils. And so really, if you think about the turn of the century, one big change that took place, we're talking about the early 1900s, two big changes that took place. One is that NPK fertilizers became widely available. And secondly, fewer and fewer animals were on the farm, which, which meant, you had fewer rotations, fewer forage and sod-based rotations that mended and healed the soil and added organic matter. So you had a loss of organic matter. You had a loss of a spectrum of minerals that are being applied to the soil. So that's what this is about. And so there's a real interest in nutrient-dense foods, how food serves as medicine, and how to both grow and how to measure nutrient-dense foods. Also, there are big uh, 
big emphasis on crop vitality and pest control. What I call the metabolic approach is crop vitality that comes from understanding the proper mineral balance and how to promote plant health through soil, soil amendments and foliar fertilization and fertigation. And then ways to monitor and measure this through holistic soil tests and different kinds of petiole and sap analysis tests and different biological terrain assessments with a Brix meter refractometer, electrical conductivity meter, a pH meter, a redox meter, and so forth. So this is some work that Jim Porterfield, he's a consultant in, in Illinois. He is, he followed the Michael Estera system known as ideal soil. He took some broccoli from the Urbana farmer's market and co compared it to the USDA average for food uh, food composition of minerals and nutrients. And he did the same thing with um, some broccoli that came from a garden that had taken a holistic soil test, came back and applied the minerals according to the ideal soil prescription. And this is the comparison. So you can see you've got um, uh, less protein, iron, magnesium, phosphorus, potassium, sodium, zinc, copper and manganese, and then on, on the soil that was mineralized properly, you had a better, better value of nutrient density, um, except for on sodium. So that's what um, people are interested in when they say nutrient dense, a lot the sort of um, nutritionists have a one way of defining nutrient dense, but in eco-agriculture, this is what we're talking about, nutrient dense foods. Are the foods depleted with nutrients or are they built up? Because we understand how to do the soil test and how to come back and actually fertilize the soil properly. So here's the other example. The one on the left is organic beets bought from a grocery store. They were grown in, in Mexico. And then the one on the right is another um, uh, grower who did the ideal soil prescription. And you can see really significant differences there. And so one of the arguments for eco-agriculture that stands above uh, or is an extra uh, tool for organic is that you can have this knowledge base to understand what is the nutrient level of your produce and then how to improve it. And how that then, you know, you take that down the ladder and then, you know, that's tied into human health and, and animal health. So the other program uh, or initiative that has been instrumental in this is the Bionutrient Food Institute, which is, like I said, Dan Kittredge's um, project that he started and now has a whole team of people working with him. So this, in this example, these are spinach leaves. They're looking at iron content. And uh, over a sampling of 139 different farms, they saw this comparison where it would take 14 spinach leaves to be equivalent to the mineral amount in one spinach leaf on the high-end farm. And they do this with a number of nutrients and they also do it with antioxidant materials like, like when we say antioxidants, we're talking about polyphenols and flavonoids and lycopene and, and these different antioxidants that are very important for human health. That's one of the reasons why fruits and vegetables are really, really great for human health because they fight free radicals. They, they fight uh, aging. That's what antioxidants do. They lend electrons instead of steel electrons. So it's a really important part of human metabolism. In this instance, um, it would take 100 spinach leaves uh, on the low end to be equivalent to one single spinach leaf on the high end. So that's also tied into this concept of obesity because we're hungry, because our food is not properly grown or, or, and doesn't have the proper nutrients in it. And so people are consuming more because their body craves more. So this is all tied into this, this concept with eco-agriculture. And then finally, the, the new thing that the Bionutrient Food Institute came up with is this sort of an index chart. And so that took into consideration six different elements and two antioxidants, and th this is what it would came out to. Like carrots, you would have to eat three carrots. Uh, um, um, let's see. So you know, so to uh, be equivalent to one uh, of the good stuff. So and it goes on. Uh, let's see. Bok choy was six, and potatoes. I mean, you know, six and potatoes was six, and lettuce was seven, seven x all that. 
So that's really helpful to get an understanding on the front end. And so what does that mean? So if we boil this down and um, to make a long story short, these are some of the key labs that provide a holistic soil test. And we break that down by the pioneers, William Albrecht and Kerry Reams, and they are slightly different soil tests uh, and different consultants use those differently. So, uh, so anyways, you've got Brookside Labs in Ohio, Kinsey Ag Labs and Perry Ag Labs in Missouri, Logan Labs in Ohio on the Albrecht. And then on the Reams, you've got Crop Services International up in Michigan, Fix My Soil, International Ag Labs up in Minnesota, and then Soil Works in probably, I think that's like North Dakota. You also have Texas Plant and Soil Lab down in Texas. And if, you know, if you're asking me on a consultant level, how do we get there? This is what I'd say. Start with this, work with a consultant, find out what it is, get an interpretation and come back and apply a suite of minerals and trace elements. Yeah, okay, so we can advance there. So secondly is the holistic tissue and food test. And so you heard John Kempf talking about SAP analysis and that um, in the United States, the SAP analysis is available through advancing eco-agriculture. It's actually done through a lab in the Netherlands called Novacrop. But in addition, that's not the only option out there. There's a paleo analysis test from Texas Plant and Soil Lab. There's a relatively newer leaf extract analysis test through apical crop science out on the West Coast. And so, and then if you want to say, for example, you've got a farm, you've got a produce garden and you wanna find out, hey, how, do, how does my food compare to the USDA food composition tables? Uh, you can actually send your produce sample to a &L Great Lakes Lab and, and it's actually a feed analysis and then it will come back and report all that. This is really interesting to do. You know, have, you really have no idea until you try this. You know where your crops are coming in at. And then um, I have done this on farms. We did. Now let's just say, for example, you've got a typical tissue test, a tissue test that you get from a, a common lab, like let's say Spectrum Analytic. That kind of a standard tissue test I call a snapshot. These SAP analysis and petiole analysis tests are call, I call forward looking. The snapshot shows you what's in the plant that has come up to this point, you know, in the past history up to today. These, these secondary tests show you where is the crop needs going to be in a week to two weeks. If you know that, you can come back with a foliar. You can target what trace elements it's telling you you need, and you can promote plant health and nutrient density and this concept around nutrition as the basis for pest management. So then the next thing to know is just, let's just boil a whole library down to just three books that I wanna to point to you. And so one of them is Bill McKibben's book. He is a consultant for Logan Labs. He actually had another book that came out and this one here that's called A Grower's Guide for Balancing Soils. A Practical Guide to Interpreting Soil Tests came out very recently, it came out last year, 2021. So it's brand new, really good. Uh, you know, this is the modern age. Um, this information was not available when I was coming up uh, in learning agriculture. So things have never been better. So you can get that, you can learn a lot. Um, the second one is The Ideal Soil Book by Michael Estera. He's the one who really revolutionized the ability for farmers and gardeners to get a hold of these calculations that would otherwise only be available if you went and attended one of these four day seminars and maybe attended three or four of these four day seminars. And he put that in people's hands. People have put together spreadsheets on this and you get a test, one, like I said, one of these Albrecht soil tests from Logan Labs or from Brookside Labs, you run it through a spreadsheet and it gives you a good breakdown of what you need. Then uh, Steve Solomon, who's a garden writer who was from the Pacific Northwest, now he's in Australia. He took, he and Estera had a project, uh, it went south, but um, he went ahead and finished this book on the intelligent gardener. 
And that has been a huge, huge influence. Um, a lot of people have picked up on that through Steve Solomon, Solomon's book. He kind of breaks down the stairs to make it more practical with some tables and charts. And then uh, outgrowth of Steve Solomon and another uh, outfit has been to develop this online calculator. And so for a very nominal fee of $10 a year, you can run multiple soil tests through there. And um, then it will spit out this, these kind of recommendations. So this is a really good starting point. Just trying to download this floating uh, menu so you can see the whole slide there. All right, so then let's say you get, um, you've got a soil test, you get an interpretation report back and it's gonna tell you you need, say so many pounds of rock phosphate, so many pounds of, um, uh, uh, KMAG, some boron, some copper, some zinc, you know, and so forth. So you mix that up, put that in your soil. Then you have these options of doing foliar feeding tank blends and fertigation tank blends. And so foliar, uh, foliars and fertigations, they're really similar in many ways. You've got protein nitrogen, so that means you've got fish, you've got hyd hydrolysates, uh, fish used to be the most common one, but there's actually quite a few uh, plant peptide-based hydrolysates now that have protein nitrogen. Seaweed is popular. Sea minerals are popular. Chelated trace elements, biologicals, all kinds of microbial inoculants, humic acid, molasses, etc. So these are your this is part of your toolbox. And just as an example, this is an actual. Uh, mix that I was putting together with the market farmer. So that's what you're looking at. You've got feather meal there. You see you've got some copper, manganese, all these trace elements are all mixed up in that. So that's your fertilizer and your trace elements that you can mix in with compost. And you can do this on a small scale. If you're just doing biointensive beds, a five gallon bucket is enough. Uh, you can mix that up per bed. Say like your bed is four feet wide by 20 feet long or 60 feet long or 100 feet long, you can figure this out. You can also do this on a per acre basis with compost spreaders. And this is a 200 acre organic farm I was doing consultancy with down in Austin. And we actually took trailer loads of all these minerals and trace elements to a very large compost operation. He would mix it all together and deliver semi loads of this compost fertilizer blend at enough to fertilize 50 acres at a time. So we're talking about a lot of good fertility going into this kind of a growing system. And that's what it looks like on a bed. Typically you're looking at applying five tons to 10 tons per acre. It's pretty common. And then incorporating it into the soil. So then we get down to how does that all relate? And so there was a, a consultant who's been to a lot of these Eagle Ag conferences. He's, he's taught at a lot of organic farming conferences named Reggie Destry. And he was a consultant for Dram Liquid Fish. This was some field work that he'd actually did up in Wisconsin or the upper Midwest. And so let's look at this. So he's got, uh, this is your plant, uh, your, your biological terrain assessment is plant, sap pH and plant sap bricks readings and plant sap electrical conductivity readings. And so there is a goal there uh, that they have this concept where, you know, EcoAg has this concept as the ideal plant sap is around 6.2 to 6.4, that your bricks reading should be over 12 and then, you know, electrical conductivity and so forth. So what he found out is that when his sap pH and his sap bricks were in the optimum range, he had very few aphids. And then as those um, plant fluid measurements went out of balance, he had a boatload more aphids. So this was a really good field demonstration of this concept, this whole ecoag concept is that, do we understand, can we understand the dynamics of a healthy uh, soil and healthy plants and is there a way to measure and monitor them? And does it influence insects? And then this is saying it is. Um, and then of course, John Kemp's lecture yesterday stated categorically that you can control 
insect pests and diseases through good nutrition. Uh, I will say that it's easier said than done in the field. It's a learning curve. So uh, just as a quick example, this was uh, one of Reggie Gestry's um, uh, recommendations for a foliar program. So let's look at that. In a, you, know, you say you're putting out 15 gallons or 20 gallons of water per acre in a spray tank. And so he's got um, several ounces up to three gallons of some kind of a biological. He's got, um, he's got something that, like, that's a agri-energy resources. SP1 is their compost extract, or it could be a liquid, uh, could be some kind of biological you, you brew on the farm. Could, and then some uh, plant food, some potassium, some trace elements, a little bit of neem and so forth. Okay, so that was a quick snapshot on the mineral section. So let's go to the next one, which is on biology. And biology, it really embraces the whole biological farming concept, which includes compost, cover crops, multi-species cover crops, good crop rotations, including grazing and proper tillage. It's, it's uh, various kinds of on-farm brewed microbial inoculants and purchased microbial inoculants. Just the whole smorgasbord there. The soil food webs included in that. Soil biology, soil food web, soil biota, microbiome. But you know, you do not have the microbiome without organic matter management. And you don't have organic matter management without biology. They're intimately tied together. So let's look at a, this is an axiom. <laughs> this, is, this is the most important thing that farmers need to understand in the history of agriculture. And that is that soil microorganisms live in association with plant roots and leaves and excrete a multitude of substances. We refer to these zones of living activity around the root as the rhizosphere and on the leaf surface as the phytosphere. This is very, very important to understand. It, it goes on and on and on forever, but you're talking about a vast soil biodiversity and if you remember life, this microbial life on the planet goes back four and a half billion years or four billion years. And then plants and microbes co-evolved from the very beginning. From the very first time land plants appeared, they co-evolved with these microorganisms. So they live in association with each other. They talk to each other. There's a huge feedback system that goes on all the time. And then if you think about the vast terrestrial habitat on the planet, that, which is the leaf surface of plants that cover the earth, they're covered in a whole community of microorganisms. So that's helpful to understand. And trying to get it to advance. So now, so let's look at something that I find very interesting, which is the composition of a bacterial cell. You can see that it's about 70% water and 30% chemicals or substances, and of those, there's proteins, there's DNA, there's RNA, there's different small molecules, there's phospholipids and polysaccharides. Now, what's interesting in the cellular conversion of CO2 by plants through photosynthesis into, uh, to capture carbon or by various other conversions, there's a number of metabolites that are, and compounds that are produced in both bacterial cells and in plant cells. Then these, this, so in bacterial cells, the ones that I think are really important to point out are amino acids, enzymes, organic acids, plant hormones, polysaccharides, and vitamins. So, and there can be thousands of these enzymes that are produced in bacterial cells. So that's really helpful to understand. And secondly, if we talk about enzymes, an enzyme is a protein that is produced by microbial plant and animal cells to act as a catalyst. They act as a catalyst on a substrate, like a compound, um, a living compound or one that is being digested after it is dead. There's uh, a number of soil enzymes that um, live separately from these plant and microbial cells. Um, they live inside the cell, they live outside the cell. And if you have different substances that are being created 
or broken down, you have enzymes to do this work. And so you have enzymes that work on starch, on sulfur, on glucose, cellulose, on chitins, on hydrogen and phosphorus and proteins and urea and lipids and fatty acids. And they're very complex looking. So that's, that's an actual image of amylase, which is important in the conversion of starch to sugar. And the other thing that we, we, which John Kempf mentioned yesterday was that these enzymes are driven by cofactors. These cofactors are these metallic, in, metallic ions, these elements. And so amylase is acted upon by both calcium and chlorine. So just one, for example, one application, a foliar application of C minerals could be very important by adding these uh, metallic cofactors. The second one is uh, organic acids. Trying to get that floating thing off there again. So the organic acids are produced by plants and microbes. Um, they are very important in a number of functions like solubilization, mineralization, biological control, detoxification, chelation. You have lactic acid, acetic acid, citric acid, oxalic acid, malic acid, and et cetera, et cetera. So if you have rock dust, uh, very popular in organic farming. Um, it's not going to become available until it's acted upon by microbes that are producing enzymes and organic acids. They can solubilize and mineralize and etch out these minerals off of relatively inert substances and so forth. So that's really helpful to understand. Okay, now I'm going to mention um, very briefly three really important um, principles. So number one is the principle of microbial abundance and diversity, or more simply, let's just call it microbial density and diversity. What that means is that it's the population abundance and complex diversity of soil microorganisms that drive soil function. So that means a greater amount of microbial biomass and a great complexity of different genera and different species within those genera of these microorganisms that drives the building of soil structure and managing soil organic matter and converting that into soil humus and retaining soil moisture and promoting soil fertility and disease suppression. All of that is related to microbial density and diversity that is promoted by this series of biological farming practices that build soil organic matter and promote soil biology. So the, the next one is, this next one is soil food web functioning, also known as soil microbial community functioning. So we've talked about the rhizosphere and the rhizosphere, the, the, phy, the rhizosphere and the phylosphere. These areas are where farmers actually have an influence to be aware of. So there's both plant growth promoting rhizobacteria. There is a boatload of different kinds of symbiotic and saprophytic fungi. And what's important to know is they have these ecosystem services. They are involved in, back, there's bacterial and fungal decomposers. They're involved in nitrogen fixation, carbon fixation, transformation and availability of nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur. There's phosphorus solubilizing bacteria, manganese solubilizing material, any kind of element. They are involved in biological control of diseases and insects, phytohormones and bioactive substances. Uh, then they have, we already talked about the organic acids, the soil enzymes, and then a bunch of polysaccharides that function as slimes, glues, and cements are very important in, in building soil structure. So I gotta get my slide to advance. Okay, so the last one is the concept known as microbially enhanced nutrient delivery or the MEND concept, M-E-N-D. This came out of Graham State's work in Australia with Nutritech Solutions in Australia. And it echoes what we just said. It is the number, and the density and diversity of microorganisms that live on the phylosphere and the rhizosphere that influence the uh, availability of nutrients. That's what it says. It's, it's an incredible concept. And so once you understand that as a farmer, this is fantastic because now you're pulling together everything that science knows about how plants work in, uh, in, in concert with microorganisms and 
And what can you do with that? Well, if you understand that, then your foliars and your fertigation blends can include microbes, they can include uh, minerals. You can make and help them work together and then make those nutrients more bioavailable to plants and become more efficient. And as a result of that, when farmers implement these practices, they have seen a reduction of fertilizer inputs very commonly from 75% to 70, from 25% to 75% or even 100% because now you have all this working together for you. Uh, so this is a really big toolbox concept. And now um, the next little section I wanna talk about are liquid compost extracts. I wanna echo what David C. Johnson was talking about. I did a bunch of work with this in, in my past work, especially down in Texas. We did really large scale uh, uh, very large amount of production of liquid compost extracts and land applications. So when you take compost, you put it in a Dixie cup, swish it around, put it on a microscope. This is what you're looking at. These are the four big groups, bacteria and fungi. That's your bi microbial biomass, huge diversity, a huge amount of this. And then these grazers, the protozoas and nematodes, they graze on the microbial biomass and they release nutrients and they all, all these different functions in ecosystem services. So if you're going to get into this you know, look into that, one thing, a couple key um, pieces of equipment you can be aware of is the GOT Brewer. This one is, um, he sells the hardware that you see on top of the tote. You provide the tote, you provide the compost and the compost goes into the compost sack. It's highly agitated it dislodges this microbiology that you're looking at right there. That is dislodged into the water. If you wanna make a tea, you can add food sources to this and brew it for 24 to 36 hours. If you wanna make an extract, you do it for 90 minutes and stop. You don't add anything to it, that's it, you've got an extract. There's some differences there between a compost tea and a compost extract. The extracts have really revolutionized broad scale applications in agriculture versus the teas. The next one is the Erath Earth uh, compost tea. This is like a hydrocyclone. That's Sabino Cortez who invented that. Um, and he was one of the guys who promotes, uh, promoted Serengeti grazing. And he would take this extract with some molasses and fish sprayed on pastures and had incredible hay production, forage quality through the roof. Uh, Bermuda grass forage quality on par with alfalfa. And so that these two are very popular. This one can also be used to make a tea or an extract. And then this one is, I'll just mention this one. This is the one that uh, Sustainable Growth Texas had. This one could make 3,000 gallons an hour continuously. Uh, this one is the one that really revolutionized really large scale applications on land. So then it, it's helpful to be aware of biospray technology. Let's just say we're gonna take a typical backpack sprayer or a mist blower or ag pesticide equipment. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this ag equipment and what we're gonna do is dedicate this for biologicals and organics, and that's it. Now we're using ag spray technology for biospraying. And then uh, I think in the, there's, we're kind of coming up short on time. So I'm gonna skip over two slides. Um, this one I'm just mentioning is the EM system, effective microorganism. The second one is the Korean natural farming. They're in your slideshow, but I wanna mention as an example, what these, Nature farming systems have done are really empowering farmers because in this instance, the Korean natural farming system, you can actually culture microbes on your farm by placing some cooked rice out there, get the microflora to grow onto this, and then they use this as a starting, like a culture, like a sourdough, cult, sourdough culture to promote, to produce a number of different microbial concoctions and recipes. So that was from a hop farm up in Ohio. The second one is taking milk and making a lactic lactobacillus bacteria serum. A couple examples there. The one on the right is even a more advanced one. You start with the labs or the lactobacillus and you add spirulina and kelp. You get a different consortia of bioactive substances that come out of that. 
This one is the Ian e. Bokashi. This is taking wheat bran or rice bran. It's inoculating with the mother culture and molasses and fermenting it. And then it can be used in food scrap buckets. The other thing that is happening, which is very interesting and is a new innovation is what people like, what I call ag bran Bokashi. And that is taking this same kind of Bokashi, but adding ingredients to it that are promoting for plant growth promoting. So what we did was uh, we, we took some ag brand Bokashi at the research farm. We put some into a standard potting mix like Pro Mix at 1%, 3%, and 5%. And uh, this, we had a linear growth curve. I mean, this was outstanding. And this is a very simple additive to a potting mix. This is becoming really popular now with cannabis growers is Grokashi and different kinds of ag brand Bokashi. So we are coming up, we've got just a few minutes left, but um, I've, I have a short uh, section on energy. This is the third pillar of eco-agriculture and that is energy. So energy uh, recognizes, you know, how energy influences photosynthesis, but it also includes things like measuring bricks and re redox. And then it gets into biofield, electromagnetic and scalar energies and paramagnetic and subtle energy. This one is definitely the, the new kid on the block. If you're asking me, I'd say definitely focus on the first two, get really good at minerals biology, and then add in this third leg and work with this on a trial basis. We're still, it's a huge area of study. So, but there's some really cool things going on in that area. So let's, let's take a real quick look. So let's recognize starting out that all life on earth co-evolved with a natural barrage of earthly and cosmic energies. And that's why the ideal man looks like Adonis and not Jabba the Hutt. <laughs> that's, that's why we look like we do. That's why things are shaped and formed like we, we look at now, uh, because we co-evolved with this energy. And then what's important is to understand how natural, extremely low frequencies that come, that naturally occur in nature, how do they influence biological systems versus more of the electro smog, electromagnetic frequencies how do they influence biological systems? And so that is actually becoming important in our, our modern day. So for example, the Schumann resonance, the, the natural background resonance of the earth at 7.83 Hertz, how does that influence biological health versus Wi-Fi? How does that influence cellular health? Now there's two things, take home messages. I'll just put them out there and you can ponder on this in that number one, DNA, is a fractal antenna. Number two, water is a resonant medium that receives and is influenced by these ELFs and EMFs. And DNA and water are integral to cells. And so how does all that influence cellular health at the, for humans, for plants, for animals that we're raising on our farm? So when we break this down and look at the bioenergetic pillar in eco-agriculture, uh, Hugh Lovell referred to this as quantum agriculture. So on the front end, what I want to point out is that these, there's a natural background amount of biomagnetism and electricity that occur in our surroundings, in our environment. So polarity, biomagnetism, Magniculture, electroculture are part of this concept in this toolbox. Then another area is known as subtle energy. That includes etheric energy, prana, chi, orgone, biofield. Biofield is the new term to describe uh, this subtle energy that's more like a blueprint behind biology that is subatomic. And so then you have keywords like bioresonance, coherence, biophotons, scalar, Victor Schauberger, cymatics. And then when you get down to brass tacks, there's scattered devices, there's pendants and plates, there's ormus, various plasma uh, activated water, agrohomeopathy, 
biodynamic preparations, radionics, and, and pendulum dowsing. Seed treatments with, uh, with magnetism and with pyramids, vortex and structured water and geometric shapes. These are all part of the toolbox. And then I would say that the whole point of all this is to increase the energetic, energetic vitality of living systems. And so then, uh, so we're, that's pretty much it. I'm not, I'm not gonna go on and on like that. I'm just gonna give a couple examples. So the first one is work with an agrohomeopathy spray uh, from Enzo Nostati in Italy. This was a um, decomposition study. So what they did was they took some chicory that was grown in the field, they split it in half. And what they did was they sprayed one half with water and the other half with the homeopath homeopathic spray. They, and then they put them in water and they let these, it's like a self decomposition test. Over time, how do they respond? And so um, you can see the one on the right was sprayed, the one on the left had, was treated with water, and then this is, this is what it looks like over several hours. So that's up to nine hours, and in, uh, I didn't include another slide that went up to 19 hours. But you can see that, that in fact, yeah, people say, no, no, there's nothing to homeopathics. Oh, really? This is what farmers are actually doing out in the field. Uh, and plants are a great test subject to use for these kinds of studies. So that's the first example. The other thing, this is kind of comes out of Victor Schauberger's work was this interest in the vortex of water, how implosion uh, leads to centripetal forces versus cent centrifugal forces. And so, so, and this also came out of uh, people studying Rudolf Steiner's and his, his, some of his work got into projective geometry. And so John Wilkes and others developed these flow forms. And so farmers are actually using these now. They use these to stir the biodynamic preparations. They use these to activate water. They're just really cool looking things for gardens and things. Uh, they're, they actually have used these in septic systems and cleaned up um, you know, septic systems, water for you know, living ponds and things like that. So in this instance, here's an example of the research that they did. And these were some, this was some wheat seed that was put in water. And what you're seeing between the different rooting characteristics and shoot growth amongst these wheat seedlings is simply the way that the water was managed. Was it, was it just tap water or was it water that was run through these various flow forms? And so what that's saying is that this geometric shape and the rhythmic movement, movement of water that goes through these floor, flow forms does in fact have an influence on the water and it does in fact have an influence on wheat seed germination. So that's it, I think that's it folks. <laughs> That was like a snapshot, uh, trying to describe eco-agriculture, uh, why it's important uh, to pay attention to minerals, biology, and energy with a big emphasis on the first two and, and then kind of experimental learning curve on the last one. Outstanding, Steve, you put a lot in there. It's like, you had, it's like... Yes, <laughs> months months of lessons distilled yeah, into I, like uh, forty five minutes. So that's um, why that, that's why I shared the slides are like cliff notes um, because yeah. uh, there's a lot to cover there. And I could not have given you this lecture when I started out in agriculture. It took me a long time to uh, to um, learn all this and put it together. And well, so, it, I, we know that you've spoken at all the big conferences, like multi day side back to back sessions. So um, we just are so grateful. Let me ask you a few. Okay, lots of detailed questions. Um, question from Maggie here is, um, how would you address or test uh, soils on a farm that grows a variety of vegetables where bed to bed, the nutrient makeup might be very different? Um, it's not very economical in that situation for her to test every bed. Um, so how do you, how do you, what would be your recommendation for that farmer um, to make an oh. overall adjustment based on what? Sure. Hi, Maggie. Um, it's Maggie Duncan, so, Salad Days Farm, who I think. Salad Days, right. Yeah. I've heard many things. And by the way, folks, I do not actually get out uh, and visit farms. It's not part of my, actually, I'm a farm manager. And so farm managers, we don't leave. <laughs> we just stay at the farm and we get things done. And um, so 
but I, I know there's some really great farms out and around the territory. And some of my colleagues like Krista Jacobson and her, her group, they've probably been over there to salad days. So, but anyways, uh, so the answer is, is that I would get a soil test, a holistic soil test. I would do the, the across the board application and I would treat it generically. Uh, even though you're growing, say, like carrots and lettuces and broccoli, all you know, all in the same different beds and things like that, you want to address the basic foundation of the mineral balance. And one of the things that I will say that um, you know, and again, I'm speaking from a consultancy point of view. I haven't. This has not been proven through what we're doing there, because research is very slow and meticulous. I'm just speaking from the broader experience. So the point is, is that. Um, there's been a pushback on the Albrecht system, but they have not, I will say that almost every paper that published on it never really understood what he's saying is we're not talking about calcium magnesium ratio. We're talking about everything, calcium, magnesium, potassium, magnesium, sodium, all the trace elements, get them all in the soil, let them all start doing their work and then get some biology working. After you've done all that, then you're tweaking it with some foliars and fertigation. Great. Thanks for that. Um, uh, questions from, from Steve. Um, from Steve. Um, it's really asking, you know, and this might be a challenging question for you to answer since you're at the land grant, at a land grant institution, but in your experience, what research is coming out of land grant institutions, Kentucky or otherwise, about these three pillars of eco agriculture? Is it happening in those spaces? Oh, the, 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 the biological pillar uh, has exploded, mushroomed, fantastic research on microbiome, uh, the whole tie-in to soil organic matter and carbon across the board, um, everywhere from USDA, NRCS is on board with soil health to just an incredible, um, I'd say since the 1990s is when it all took off. And the journals uh, have fantastic graphics and, and understanding now. So that's, that's for sure. Uh, you, you saw David C. Johnson's work. I really admire his work. And we are going to build um, a bio, compost bioreactor at our research farm this year, probably a couple of them. And we've got someone who's going to come over and work with us on that. So. The, the mineral area, there's a few papers here and there on the mineral balance area that it kind of is tricky to say, to pinpoint because, you know, research is like this point here and this point here. Uh, so there's some things I can, can pull together if someone asks me. And then uh, even on the third area, the third leg of the stool, I actually have a good little library of, of papers to support that. And for example, one of the researchers I follow is from Italy and he published a paper on a number of these uh, biostimulants and biologicals, but he also published a paper that showed very positive results using a structured water device to grow plants in a greenhouse. Very, very solid research, showed positive result. Wonderful. Yep. Um, we'll get that link from you and share it out too. How about that? Yeah. Um, we do have a quick question in the chat. Once you get that uh, beam reactor up, can we, uh, and you, you get it going for a year, can we do a field day with you? Absolutely. In fact, um, I mean, I can just tell you right now, we could do, we could do, a, we could do a great workshop on EM, effective microorganisms on Bokashi. Uh, we could throw in some Korean natural farming stuff. We could do the, the compost bioreactor. Yes. Okay. Y'all heard it here. It's going to happen. <laughs> this is how we do it in Kentucky. Um, okay, let's see. We are we are one minute over. Um, let's uh, let's just wrap up with a couple more questions. Um, thinking about um, question from Ed. So not long ago, uh, worms were being introduced to improve soils. Now we have problems with invasive worm species. Are we introducing exotic bacterial cultures that will be viewed as invasive in the future? What are your thoughts okay, on that? Okay, Ed, well, um, I thought you were gonna ask me how we're gonna solve the exotic worms. I'm glad, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> but, um, but on the exotic bacterial cultures, let me just point out that, for example, uh, the EM, Microbial consortium is very simple and that is naturally occurring. Lactobacillus occurs everywhere. 
Uh, phototrophic bacteria occur everywhere. Yeast organisms occur everywhere. So that's not, they're not really exotic. Uh, the, and then the Korean natural farm uh, microbes are produced from your farm. You're actually culturing them from your own farm. And um, so I'd say, you know, one, one thing I might add is that one, one of the many years ago when I started getting into this, uh, the, I was asked to give a lecture on, on biological control mechanisms uh, with compost and, and biological farming. And what I discovered is that a lot of the commercial products, the species that are in commercial products are the same exact species that you can produce on your own farm. So that's really good to know. Great. Couple more questions. And if folks have to go, that's okay, but you just keep throwing them in here. So I'm gonna keep asking them. Um, this one, um, have you looked at the electronic communication between plants and microbes or between plants and insects? So the one thing we can say there that's very interesting was the different the interaction between the way plants emit infrared uh, frequencies and how plants detect those. And so the person to know about there was Dr. Phil Callahan. He was an entomologist with USDA, USDA and he was an electronics genius and traveled all over the world. And because of his background from World War II and radio frequency communications, he, he published a lot on how insect antennas are, are picking up on electromagnetic frequencies. So, um, so that's very interesting is Phil Callahan. Great, thanks for that. Um, okay, two more questions. Do you have a favorite cool season cover crop mix for soil life soil biodiversity, yes. anything you'd recommend that roller crimps well. Yes. And by the way, if you've got a cell phone, you should be wearing some kind of a EMF protection device. That this is just common sense. This, this is the real thing. We're not talking about anything exotic. Uh, so the, on cover crops, what we have done at the research farm is that we have, we have a, a, whenever we have a chance to grow a cover crop, and, and have the ground covered, that's what we do. We also use living mulches between alleyways and plastic mulch beds. And then we have winter cover crops. We have a summer cover crop when we have a field that's in green fallow during rot rotation. So we typically do three cover crops at a time, but in our summer cover crop green fallow rotation, we have gotten up to 10 species. And so um, the big, Common cover crops are always still going to stand out. The, the winter cover crops, like if you're planting early and you want to get winter kill, for example, the organic farming section that Christy Durbin manages, they do, and, and Aaron German, a really good crew over there, they grow uh, winter kill cover crops. They'll do Austrian winter peas and spring oats, and they'll get those up and growing, they'll winter kill. And then all, pretty much across the farm, we're doing winter barley, vetch, and clover. A lot of people do rye, vetch, and clover. Uh, we do a lot of um, buckwheat, we do cow peas, we do teff, and then for our summer cover crop, we do, like I said, we do 10 species. I'm actually including field corn in there. I've got soybeans, cow peas, buckwheat, tillage radish, clover, sun hemp, diversity. The more, the concept here is that the more diversity above ground influences more diversity, soil food web diversity below ground. That's the concept of multi-species cover crops, which is pretty cool. You grow more diversity above ground, and some of these farmers in the in that are doing no-till, uh, either with herbicides or with roll, rolling rolling crimpers, they're they're doing twenty-way and thirty-way species of cover crops. Andy, yeah. Um, okay. So, last question because we are six minutes over time now. Um, from Ian, do chemicals used in municipal water systems have a negative effect on the biology of plants and soil? Uh, that it's a it's a if you want to, you can get a filter. If you're going to make a compost tea and you're going to focus on that, that's the strategy that you want to go with. You can actually get a kind of a, a dechlorination. A filter and I think that other what's that called chloramine or whatever and if that's important to you that would be very helpful but um, I will say that if you make just you get tap water and you make tea 
uh, it, the biology and the humic materials in there completely overwhelm the negative effect of the chlorine and all that kind of stuff. And we use, we use city water at our farm. We don't, we've, we do, we actually tried to drill wheel water. We, we were not successful. Uh, we thought that would be really sustainable if we, we, we did, but we use city water and we're growing organic crops out there. And, and, and we do both conventional and organic on our farm. And we grow, we grow good crops and our plant, our, you know, our, our biology is still there. Organic matter is still there. So it's not a, it's not a terrible thing. Well, I, we are at time. We have to say goodbyes. And Steve, just thank you so much. We're so grateful for the time you share here. All you do at um, the Horticulture Research Farm, for anyone on the call that is in Kentucky or wants to drive on through Kentucky, uh, the Horticulture Research Farm really has it going on. We encourage you to visit them when they have an event that is open to the public and also um, to join us at uh, field day that we have um, there, and we can drop the field day um, link in the chat. Um, so there, it's always such a great time being there with y'all. We got it going on. So thank you. Um, thanks everyone for being- I look forward to, I love oh, coming out there. We've got, we've got a couple things planned this year. Um, you know, COVID slowed us down. We're still going and blowing and going out there. Uh, so, um, you know, hope to see more of you out there. And I do see a number of names on the, on the chat list. It's people I've known for a long time from all over. A lot of people I don't know, but, um, hope it was helpful. It was a big, fast action snapshot, but you have, my, yeah. you have my slides, you can review them. And if you have any questions, my, you can get a hold of me later. Fantastic.